So, um, on to the product. So, the active ingredient in Flipper is unsaturated carboxylic acids. So, um, unsaturated carboxylic acids are a, a naturally occurring compound, and uh, at Alphabeo, we extract and derive our unsaturated carboxylic acids from um, olive oil. So this plant that you can see here, this is actually the plant where our active ingredient, ingredient is uh, formulated. And it goes through, well, we take the olive oil, so it goes through a, a multi-stage process of purification, of distillation. Um, and this is all done under very tightly controlled parameters. Um, and it's all done under uh, government um, authorized factory facilities and every sample is, is batch tested to these really tight parameters. So the result of, of all of this is that we have an active ingredient that is based on a food grade material. So it's olive oil and from which we've extracted these um, naturally occurring compounds. And then because of this, it's exempt from MRLs, which is just um, uh, really fantastic for, for growers who are concerned about residues or um, selling their produce into uh, zero residue crops or organic growers. Um, and we're expecting the product to be classified as being of a low risk substance, which would have dramatic um, implications for the um, future of the, of the product. <coughs> okay, so um, yeah, what are uh, carboxylic um, acids? Well, they're, um, they're a family of, of naturally occurring compounds, and like all families, they come in different shapes and different sizes. So we're all used to thinking about things like azoles and SDHIs, and we all know that within those azoles and SDHIs, you have different uh, chemical compounds within those families, and they're all slightly different shapes and slightly different sizes. So you can kind of think about carboxylic acids in the same kind of way. The difference being is that they're from the natural world. Um, so these different Chains. So you have um, short chain carboxylic acids. These are already used in agriculture um, to control bacteria and animal feeds. You have medium chain carboxylic acids, just slightly longer and a few more carbon chains. And these are starting to be used um, quite um, actively as a, as a herbicide. So for example, pelagonic acid, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and then you have the long chain carboxylic acids. And this is where um, the active ingredient for flipper is. So in that process of distillation and purification, we're really selecting for a very select grouping of carboxylic acids to make it into the final product. And these are really active on um, insects as well as fungal diseases. And um, the activity really depends on how many carbons are on the chain, but also importantly, where the unsaturated bond is on that carbon chain. And this is really significant because where the unsaturated part of the cha uh, chain is, changes how the um, chain can fold, and then how it folds depends how it's going to interact with biology. The last group is the very long chain carboxylic acids, but we don't really have any use for those just yet. So, um, so this long chain carboxylic acids is where the focus is for us. Okay, so um, flipper controls a really amazingly broad range of, um, of pests, and you can see here some of the major agricultural pests that, um, that, uh, that we've got some really great data on. Um, and we actually have over 200 GEP trials on Flipper supporting its use um, uh, for these pests. And another really key thing to note is that it's active on all stages of the pest life cycle. So yes, it's a, a contact acting insecticide, but because it has effect on eggs, juveniles, nymphs, as well as the adults, the effect of the application is, is quite long lasting in some of our trials. Um, a lot of these pests are also um, are resistant to some conventional chemistry like pyrethroids and neonicotinoids. And um, we've tested flipper against these, um, well, uh, aphids with a whole raft of these um, resistance mechanisms into them. And what we found is that there's no cross resistance. So flipper is as active on a resistant aphid as it is on a sensitive aphid. So when we're thinking about building insect programs with resistance management in mind with the actives that we have left, then we think Flipper has a great place in these, um, in these programs. 
Okay, so uh, as you can imagine, and as Ian mentioned, they have been conducting a, a raft of trials to verify the uh, experience at AlphaBio. And these are some of the laboratory trial results that um, have been conducted in Monheim uh, quite recently. And they were fairly simple trials, but they were just uh, trying to compare them against chemical reference products that will be used against these pests. And as you can see, the activity of the 1% solution is um, where application is perfect in a, in a laboratory scenario, the efficacy of the product is as good as a, as a conventional, um, conventional product. But the, the importance being that the application has to be really spot on to achieve these levels. They also tested out the product and a variety of host plants with very different leaf shapes um, and saw that the control level was maintained. And they also looked at the dose work, so AlphaBio recommended 1%, so they did some work to just check that out, and that was confirmed. You really don't want to dilute it too, uh, too far below 1%, or um, <coughs> efficacy will be compromised. This is a summary of AlphaBio um, trials. So um, what we're looking at here is the AlphaBio recommendation, which is uh, to apply the product at pest buildup, so right at the start of the infestation apply it in two applications of 1% and apply those within a kind of a seven day window and beneficial um, insects were, were used in some of these trials too. Um, but what we found is that in a range of crops with a range of pests, efficacy was extremely good. So, I mean, 70 to 90% control in, in almost all of these trials. So you can start to see it's an it's incredibly active product. Okay, so how is it doing this? It's probably going to be the question on most people's minds. So it's quite simple. The um, unsaturated carboxylic acids penetrate through the exoskeleton of the insect. And once inside the insect, then it's interfering with uh, vital metabolic processes. The insect stops feeding almost um, immediately. And then you, the observed symptom will be dehydration of the pest and, uh, and mortality. Okay. Um, these are some electron microscope images that Bayer have taken from their labs quite recently. And um, yeah, on the left, you can just see the untreated um, control aphid that's been sprayed with water. Um, and uh, after one day after application, looking pretty happy, and the proboscis is still penetrating through the leaf tissue and feeding. And then the 1% uh, solution, the flipper, um, there's just two pictures there, looking pretty, pretty dead and definitely not feeding. It's quite dramatic. Um, yeah, just to mention that, that the desiccation is like, it's an observed symptom of the mortality. It's, yeah, it's not desiccating the insect itself. Okay, so this is some more work that Bayard did. So they noticed this um, cessation in feeding was very, very quick, and they wanted to get, understand it a bit more. So they looked at the mortality of the aphids. And as you can see, it's taking, um, and the bar chart on the left compared to a comfortable, which I think is an eonicotinoid, it's actually very fast acting, so the insect is dead after 24 hours. But for those of us in the room, especially any carrot growers, probably really interested in virus transmission, um, the, it's not really the death of the insect, it's more like how quick is the insect stopping feeding, stopping passing the virus around through the crop. So they did another trial, um, which is just this one here. And they were looking at, um, at the honeydew that's produced by the insect, which is a really good indication of, uh, of whether it's feeding or not. And so half an hour before the application, uh, untreated flipper and comforter, they were all producing lots of honeydew. Um, half an hour, the untreated was still producing lots of honeydew, but flipper and comforter had almost <coughs> completely stopped. So this, um, this trial was, was set up with half an hour being, they thought, the minimum time. But actually, it looks like feeding um, happens even within half an hour. So it's an incredibly fast acting um, active. And if this image on the bottom left was blown up, you'd see that all the aphids on the flipper leaf are, are dead. So, yeah. Okay, um, so they did some work on some practical things like application. And um, this is 
aphid mortality at different water volumes, so uh, maintaining the dose rate of, of the product but dropping the water down. And what they found is that um, Flipper needs water to work, so it needs water to carry the product, or this is what they believe, that they need water to carry the product into the insect. And if you drop the water volume below sort of 400 to 300, we start to see a drop off in efficacy. So that's an important thing to be thinking about when we're applying the product away from some of the high value, high water volume crops into broad acre vegetables, um, these kinds of crops where the water volumes are so much lower is that we need to maintain these water rates if we can. Yeah, um, being a contact acting only product, they wanted to um, just double check that it was definitely contact only. And what they did was they um, applied flipper onto the top of the leaf only. They didn't try to get the product underneath the leaf at all. So um, the aphids were under the leaf I think um, it was a test to see, is there any systemity in it? Is there any translamer activity in it? And the answer was um, untreated was um, no death. Um, flipper applied top and bottom of the leaf. There was very good control. Flipper being applied on the top of the leaf only, absolutely nothing happened. So just as same as the untreated. So that's just a bit of a take home message that if you're not getting contact with the pest, then you're unlikely to, um, to get any kind of control. So building on that theme, um, it's really important application is done, done correctly. So knowing your pest is absolutely key. So um, getting a, a, an understanding of its life cycle um, and also um, what stage of life cycle is it in your crop? Also, how does it behave at different times of day? how are meteorological conditions like humidity and temperature are going to change its behavior. So when you come to apply the product, can you guarantee that you're going to make contact with the, with the pest? So things like um, water volume, water pressure to make, move the leaves around, all of these factors are absolutely key to achieving, uh, achieving contact and then control. Also things like nozzles, all of these things need to be taken into account. So when Claire mentioned earlier, so, uh, some of the intricacies around the product, this is really what she's talking about. It's, um, it's really working a lot harder than maybe we're used to, to achieve contact with the pest product. It's, um, it's not something that can be taken for granted. Um, we recommend Flipper is applied at the first signs of infestation and buildup. So don't let the pest get away with you from you before you apply it. Um, and uh, you need to make sure that you, the water volume is right, so you're getting um, contact with the pest, contact with the leaf, but not to run off, um, not to, um, so that it's blowing out the other side of the crop or, or anything like this, um, Just it has to be just right. And we then say assess the performance maybe two to three days after that first application, and if you can still see some live insects um, in your crop, then a second application would be advisable. This last comment is about using um, the product in hard water areas. So like many crop protection products, Flipper is affected by very hard waters. So over 300 parts per million, um, we start to see some problems come in. So um, the next slide is focusing on this. Um, so Flipper applied into soft water. Um, on the right hand side, you can see it's completely translucent and, and clear. Where it's been applied into very hard water, I think this was about 450 parts per million, you can see this cloudy solution starting to form. And this is telling you that there's a solubility issue. The ions in the hard water have started to interact with flipper. And um, this, this could be a, an issue practically in terms of blocked nozzles and things like this, blocked filters, but also might have an effect on efficacy. So our recommendation is always to use soft water where possible. Um, if it's unavoidable and you have to use hard water, then have a look at using uh, a water conditioner that's um, not an acidifier. Um, so, um, yeah, this um, chart on the right is some work that Bayer did where they looked at the effect of, um, of this um, hard water on flipper and its efficacy. And you can probably see just about the 1% solution. Actually, it hasn't had too much of an impact on efficacy at all, but it's still something that it would be preferable to avoid if you, if you can. Um, and if you think you're in a hard water area, then just do a simple jar test. Just um, put 1% into a, into a jar and give it a shake and see if you get this cloudy formation. And if you don't, then you, you're fine. And actually, I think the, the waters in the UK compared to some of the waters in Spain and the Netherlands, it's not quite in the same league. So we, we don't anticipate there'll be too many of you out there that will experience an issue with this. 
Okay, so um, yeah, a really amazing thing about Flipper is its um, profile, its beneficial profile on pollinators and um, yeah, beneficial insects and pollinators. So we'll spend a few minutes talking about this. It's, I suppose, more relevant in, um, in the med and where people are using beneficials a great deal actively, but it's also um, really important in, in all, all veg crops. I think um, last year at the Seminist site in the flipper plots, there was parasitic wasps and there wasn't any in any of the other plots. So it's, um, these, these insects are really nice to have and uh, it's, it would be good to uh, not lose them in our sprays. Um, so this is an example of some of the data that we produced for the dossier and we did it with IPM Impact. It's just looking at the effect of flipper on uh, worker bumblebees through different ingestion types. And as you can see, the gray bars, the untreated, and then the green bar is, is flipper. And then the red is a neonicotinoid reference. Um, so through these different ingestion types, the bumblebees are largely unaffected by flipper. We've also done a huge amount of work. Um, the product just wouldn't have been as successful as it was if it hadn't had this beneficial profile. Um, and again, we did a, an awful lot of work with IPM Impact to get its IOBC rating. And as you can see, it's been given a score of one or two, which isn't, it doesn't have any effect on these major beneficial insects. It does have some effect on it, um, but not to an unacceptable level. Um, so yeah, where you're, Using beneficials, we would recommend that you um, use flipper and then release the beneficial insects as soon as the crop's dried. But if you're using it on an established population, then um, we don't think you'll be um, too disappointed with, with the results. Okay, so yeah, um, just to um, summarize this section before we get into some trial data, um, it's a naturally occurring compound and that's been submitted as low risk and we expect the results of that quite soon. Um, the whole sourcing and production of Flipper is um, formally evaluated um, by, the, by the EU. And um, yeah, it's food grade material, so it's MRL uh, exempt. So yeah, the product um, in its infancy was um, targeted at high value crops in the Mediterranean area, so um, Spain and, and Italy for use in vines. So the trial data that we have in veg and is slightly more limited, um, but I've done a bit of work to try to pull out some trials that are relevant to you. And I know that Bayer have an awful lot of trials plugged in for this year. So we're gonna get uh, an awful lot of data uh, produced hopefully for, um, for a presentation next year. But um, yeah, so Flipper is a very good product um, for, for thrips. So whether those thrips are in strawberries or for leeks or for onions, um, it's extremely effective. And this is some work that was done in the Netherlands um, just in 2019. So um, fairly straightforward trial. And you just have, um, have all untreated and then Batavia and Oli, which I think is just a wetter and all seed rate um, oil. Um, Batavia and Flipper. And then um, four sprays of, of flipper in a 1% solution. Um, and what we're looking at is percentage thrip damage. So um, Batavia and the oil um, looking like 70% sort of, 70 of, uh, of those um, onions were damaged. Um, Batavia and flipper, um, the best performing treatment there. And um, yeah, better than, better than flipper at 1%. So um, when we're thinking about building IPM programs in conventional crops, with mixing conventional chemistries and, uh, and, and flipper, there's a really good, um, good place for this. Okay, so this looks like a fairly complicated protocol. It's a 2015 trial in the Netherlands for thrips and leaks. It's not actually that complicated. In the next slide, you'll see it's quite simple, but essentially you have untreated, and then it's a, a, a straight program of eight sprays comparing uh, desis, um, vertimic, tracer, and then, and then flipper, and then six, seven, and eight are programs based on those straights. So fairly straightforward. And this is what they saw. So um, you can see the level of damage uh, from the thrips and the untreated plot on the left. Um, and then flipper um, here, just looking um, absolutely squeaky clean. And for a crop like leeks, where any kind of um, damage pretty much makes it unmarketable, this, um, this is uh, really quite uh, exciting. And the results were, um, Oh, okay. 
Okay, we'll come on to the results in a minute, hopefully. Um, so this was building up and in the same trial. So it's just talking about water volumes a little bit. So on the left, you have the product applied in 150 liters of hectare. And then on the right, you have the, um, the product applied in 600 liters per hectare. And you can see where you're going down to these really low water volumes. You're really not getting the coverage of the, of the crop. So it's unlikely that any of the product is going to have, have hit the pest. So, yeah, this is just some really nice work done by the Netherlands with some inflorescent dye just to really highlight this water volume issue. And these are the results from the trial. Okay, so um, the untreated um, percentage of leaks damage is, is there. Um, Desis is really not doing very much. And, and this is clearly as a result of, uh, of resistance issues, like we mentioned earlier. So it's um, really not doing very much. And Desis will wipe out all the beneficial insects in the crop as well. So um, yeah, not doing much there. And um, Tracer, which I think is Spinosad. Yeah, um, again, I think there's some resistance issues for Spinosad. So again, it's not doing a huge, a huge amount there. Um, and then um, the green bar, which is just this one here, is, um, is Flipper at 1%. So really outperforming some conventional um, products. So you start to see um, why there's such, a, such enthusiasm for the product. Okay. Okay, another pretty horrendous looking protocol. Don't worry about it too much. It's um, a trial in the Netherlands in 2016. And um, I think the manufacturers invited to put forward their recommended programs for um, uh, throop control in sprouts. Um, treatment number 12 is, um, is the flipper line. So that's all we need to really focus on. And um, in this trial, you can see uh, DuPont Bayer's um, programs um, all doing um, a pretty good job at defending marketable yield. But uh, actually, the uh, Alpha Bio Control Scheme number 12 was by far the, the highest performing um, program in this trial. We have been involved with, um, with the HDB and the SEPTA Plus program for a couple of years now, and we've been getting some really good results from them and some really promising feedback, and we're continuing that relationship this year. Um, this is a trial where we're looking at, um, at, at thrips and, um, and leaks again. Um, the trial was not so good. As you can see, the untreated um, is not so different to Tracer, and um, HDB 9970 is Flipper, and really there's, um, yeah, it's not really doing anything, but what, what was interesting is that we got this really good activity on um, on leak moth control. So it's just kind of building on the story that it's a really broad spectrum insecticide. And as the label grows and expands away from the EU, we're learning all the time about its activity on these pests. So there's a lot of learning to do. Um, this is just uh, moving away from thrips and thinking about aphid control. So, um, yeah, okay, the crops, tomatoes, cucumbers, um, melons and courgettes are maybe not so relevant for you in the room, but it's just telling you the story that if you get the application right, the efficacy range in, uh, in our trials, so the top, top line, you know, four trials with two applications of 1%, we're getting 65 to 85% control, and that really is quite consistent. So um, when it comes to aphid control, these are the kind of levels of efficacy that you can expect to see in your crops. Uh, we did some work on aphids in lettuce, and we had quite a few trials on this, but this is um, just one from, uh, I think, 2015. Um, it was comparing um, untreated flipper, um, flipper at 2%, oikos, which is a biological competitor, and um, conal, which I think is a neonicotinoid. And um, the first application went on right at the start of the infestation buildup which um, checked the population, but the aphid population wasn't really exploding at this time. The second application represented by the second blue arrow caught the aphid population just as it was exploding. And as you can see, it did a really good job of just checking that aphid explosion. And um, yeah, not compared to the neonic, but it was doing a really excellent job, sort of 60, 65% control um, just, from, uh, just from two sprays of, of flipper. Um, application on um, these kinds of lettuce is, is a lot easier. Something like iceberg, it's going to be a, a bit harder. But um, yeah, it's, a, it's certainly a very effective product and, um, and no phytotoxicity um, from the product that we've seen to date. There's been a couple of incidences that have been fairly exceptional. 
but on the whole, it's extremely safe. Okay, I know that whitefly is starting to become a real problem for, for some of you in the room, especially for brassicas in the Lincolnshire area. Um, and the product's extremely good on, on whitefly. We've got a huge amount of data um, on a whole range of, uh, of, of crops. So um, this is just, again, a, a summary of uh, AlphaBio's experience. Um, and it's, again, it's kind of a two, two spray approach, seven day interval at 1% um, under glass house conditions. But the control levels are just amazing. So yeah, mostly 60, 70, 80, 90% control. And this is a piece of work that we did with the STC, or sorry, uh, Stockbridge Technology Center um, in 2017. Um, and we were just checking out um, this uh, idea that it's active on all stages of the life cycles of the pest. And what this data is showing you is um, on the left is the effect of the products on the adults, and on the right, the activity on the scales. And each bar is, um, is, is time, so as time goes past, and the count of the aphids over time. So on the untreated, you can see the adult levels are fairly even. Um, chess is a, a conventional chemistry, has had a really good impact on the adults. And flipper, as the days have gone on, it's had a really amazing impact on those adults. And exactly the same story for the, for the scales of the whitefly as well. Um, yeah, it says lab conditions, but that's not strictly true. It was kind of set up in a laboratory way, but it was a glass house, glass house trial, effectively. So I don't have a clue how I'm doing for time, but um, this is essentially the summary of the, uh, of the product. So it's, it's a really innovative piece of chemistry. We're selecting for naturally occurring compounds and producing them in an incredibly high quality product. Um, as Ian mentioned, it's approved on a whole range of crops. So, I mean, um, in the UK, I think you have pretty much everything on there, um, apart from the broad acre arable, arable crop. So potatoes isn't on there currently, but um, pretty much everything else is. Um, it's really safe to pollinators and beneficial insects. There's no residue levels. There's no harvest intervals. Its efficacy is incredibly good. Um, you can use it in tank mix with a whole range of products. Um, the caveat to this is that because of this um, hard water um, issue, you need to be avoiding any tank mix partner which contains metallic ions. So things like phosphatile aluminium, don't go anywhere near it. Um, anything containing calcium, iron, magnesium, any of these kinds of um, fertilizers or crop protection products, um, it won't be compatible with those. Um, but it makes a great mix partner. Um, so yeah, for fungicides and things like this, uh, and especially biologicals like serenade. Um, yeah, there's no known resistance and there's no known cross resistance, which is important. Um, there's no re-entry restrictions. Um, you can use it during flowering, although I think good agricultural practices are always to avoid um, spraying when bees are actively foraging. Um, and uh, yeah, plant-based material, and there's um, very little evidence of any phytotoxicity. I think that's me. Okay, it's a bit of a run through. <laughs> um, has anyone got any questions? Ashley. We say something like, well, I don't think it's a recommendation, but it, you can. Uh, yeah, so um, Ashley was just asking about what the recommended water pH value is when you're um, using Flipper. I think, I think it's actually quite stable under a range of water pHs. So I think our range is like sort of five to eight, something like that. Yeah, so it's like it is very stable in a range of water pHs when you apply Flipper. The pH will go up quite high to something like 10 or 11, and this is completely normal. Yeah. Okay.